Dave, do you mind if we just borrow this practice tale for two minutes, mate? We just need to film a link for, uh, for Bay's watch. You're joking. I'll, I'll play the final in a minute, mate. Mate, it'll be two, uh, two minutes, honestly. Oh, be fine. No, cheers, a, cheers, a day cheers. off. Come on. And look at this. The show is going global. We've been to Riga in Latvia. We're in Yushan here in China. We're going back to Firth in Germany for the Bull Classic. It's been a big month for the World Snooker Tour. And it's a big show coming up. This is Bay's watch. What are you doing? One, two, Here's what's coming up on the show. With China looking to build an entire city dedicated to snooker, we drop by to see what's going on. Meet one of the fastest emerging names in women's snooker. Catch up with the boss, Barry Hearn, as he hits 70, looking back on an incredible career and an even bigger party. And finally, our Riga Masters champion takes on the great British breakoff. Before we get stuck into it, here's a roundup of all the action on the table from the last month. Last month, we were in the beautiful capital of Latvia for the Kaspersky Riga Masters. Neil Robertson won the first ranking title of the season, beating Jack Lazowski 5-2 in the final. And last week, Germany hosted the Pool Hunter Classic. Kyron Wilson lifting the trophy after a 4-2 final win over Peter Ebden. But before that, the tour headed east for the Yushan World Open, and David Gilbert looks set for his first ranking crown when he led 9-5 in the final, only for Mark Williams to fight back and win 10-9. Another piece of silverware for Willow's caravan mantelpiece. And whilst we're in Yushan, you might be wondering why I'm wearing a hard hat. Well, we couldn't not visit this place. This site is going to be the home of the new international snooker city, the world's first. The site behind us is going to be the venue for the new World Open. It's going to be a new snooker museum and a brand new snooker academy. Should we just, should we just interview someone here? Is that going to be easier? Yeah, good idea. What about that guy over there in the blue shirt? Excuse me, do you work here? Uh, yeah, uh, listen, my, my shift's only just started. I've got a lot to do, as you can see. Look at this, look. Jason Ferguson for WPBSA. How are you, mate? This was not in the jobs description, building. <laughs> so just tell us a little bit about what's going on here. Well, we're excited to be here, of course. Uh, Yushan County. You know, being from sport, you can't help but admire ambition. You know, this city has ambition to be somebody. It's, it's a lower-tiered city, not like Beijing, Shanghai that we're used to, but the ambition is to build the Billy Sport capital of the world. How ambitious is that? And this site's going to be completely transformed, isn't it, from what we just saw on the model inside? Yes, and, and what we're stood on here, we're actually stood on uh, what is going to be a brand new venue. Uh, up to 4,000 seats. It will be a multi-use venue, but it will be designed around snooker events, billiard sports events. So uh, very steep tiered uh, seating, uh, everything catered for that, that either players or the spectators would, would require. Uh, and and the, the whole site around what you see here is being transformed. Over there is going to be our brand new academy. And obviously this new tour goes all over the world, but a lot of people are wondering, why Yushan? Well, it's, it's funny, you know, it's not one of the big cities that everybody knows, like, like I said, but we're actually the thing that brought us here was actually our table manufacturers, Xingpai Star. Um, believe it or not, the blue slate, which is the, the real tough slate which is used on billiard tables, comes from Yushan Mountain. So that, that was really how we ended up here in the first place. They, they have factories here. And uh, we've been coming here for a few, few years now. Uh, with some, it started with some pool events and then became our world ranking event, our world open for the third time. And uh, the whole idea has transformed from running an event to transforming a city. It's fantastic. And it's an incredible place, John, isn't it, as well? We can see the building behind us. This is going to be built by, it's now August. They said by the end of October, this is going to be finished. I find that uh, we see this in so many cities as we travel across China. Uh, you know, the, the rate that things transform, that the rate that things grow is, is 
just unbelievable. And, uh, and, and to think that that would, that would be ready in a few months' time is just unbelievable. And they're, they're also saying that this may even be ready for next year's World Open. Um, you know, and as you can see, it's a building site. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of work to do, mate, so I'll let you get back to it. So, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jason. Yeah, cheers. cheers. Thanks a lot. We'll get back to work. Lads, there's nowhere near enough cement here. This is a big job. And rumour has it, Jason is actually still there counting that cement. Poor bloke. Hang on, how can you got to do China and Riga? You shouldn't have bought your holiday, mate. I mean, you've got the qualifiers next week, mate. Don't worry about that. Coming up next on Bayes Watch, we're looking at another area of the game at making some big progress. That's right, and the great thing about snooker is there are no barriers in terms of age, gender or nationality. We caught up with former ladies World Under 21 champion Emma Parker, who's been learning from the very best. Women's snooker has made a significant leap forward in recent years since our governing body, the WPBSA, has supported the World Women's Tour. There's more tournaments, more prize money and the chance to develop skills in a competitive environment. Snooker is one of few sports to allow men and women to compete together at professional level. Rianne Evans and Onyi compete on the sports secondary circuit, the Challenge Tour, and have competed for a place at the World Championship. The WPBSA has used a range of grassroots initiatives in recent years, both in the UK and overseas, and talented players such as former Under-21 World Champion Emma Parker are starting to emerge. My dad used to plan a pool team, so I started playing pool with him, and then my uncle introduced me to snooker, and then it just went from there. Obviously, it's my first year on tour, so I try to get some trophies, and it drives me to win even more, so hopefully I can start winning some main events now, and I've got them under my wing. They're all, all really nice girls. I talk to around quite a lot. It's all, it's all friendly, but I guess when you get on the table, no one's really your friend, so... Parker's enjoyed great success already, climbing to world number 15 after an impressive rookie season. And it's no great surprise given her practice partners at Grove Snooker Academy include Ronnie O'Sullivan and Judd Trump. I practice with um, Ronnie quite a lot up here and he's given me tips in the past and just watching him play is such a pleasure. So I really do enjoy when he's up here and I feel like I play better when he's here. I don't know why, just um, get my arm going I guess. I just think he's brilliant at what he does and I think if anyone can get close to him then that's an achievement. I'd love to be at that level, you know, I'd love to be the best woman player in the world. Now, we all know Barry Hearn is a bit of a legend, isn't he? The World Snooker Chairman has been at the top of the sports industry for over 40 years. And right here on the grounds of Matchroom Towers, he celebrated his 70th birthday. And the guy's still going strong. Next up on Bay's Watch, we caught up with the boss to take a look back on an incredible few decades. This pretty much guarantees our bonus, by the way, doesn't it? Cool. Well, Barry, thanks for speaking to us. We're just going to try and look back at your career in snooker, having just had your 70th mm. birthday. But mm. first of all, it was a rather extravagant celebration at your birthday <laughs> party. We had celebrities, Michael Buffer MC, you must have enjoyed that. I loved it. It was a great day and uh, yeah, it's a, a landmark birthday and I put my daughter Katie, Emily from Matra Multi Events and my PA of 30 plus years, Michelle, in charge and they didn't let me down. You know, it was, uh, it was spectacular and 360 people that I most wanted in the world to be there were there. So. Yeah, thoroughly enjoyable, but a terrible hangover. It lasted about six days. I mean, <coughs> we got involved. It was a proper night. Um, <laughs> and just kind of now going into to your career as, as mm. a whole, it started off, I suppose, by chance, really, didn't it? Because you, you were a textile dealer, and then, then you kind of, as a property investment, invested in some snooker holes, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, it, I was the finance director for a, a, a textile company, so my brief was negotiating contracts pre predominantly. Uh, and then an opportunity came up to buy a chain of snooker halls, which I bought as the, for the property value, really, more than snooker. I wasn't a snooker fan at that time. Uh, and then you had that little bit of luck, you know, suddenly the BBC started showing snooker on mainstream television. Everybody thought, well, this looks like a good game. The, the business exploded. And I started doing events to encourage more business. And the byproduct of that was Steve Davis walking in one day and saying, can I play in one of your tournaments? So. Fate's a strange thing, it deals you strange cards to play, but looking back on it, yeah, it was amazing what happened, you know. 
a once in a lifetime opportunity that I wasn't going to let pass. It was exciting, you know, and, and Steve just wanted to win and play. Um, but the other boys, when we had the match from eight players, you know, they were all a fundamental part of it as well. And they gave a lot of value. They, they learned how to entertain as well as play well. They learned to be characters and personalities. And, and that put the sport where it is today, really. They laid the foundations for turning it into one of the nation's favourite armchair sports. Yeah, I mean, there were some real characters uh, in, in that uh, matchroom mob. I mean, mm. If you had to kind of pick out a, a story or a moment that you had with, with some oh, of the guys... There's thousands was... of stories. I mean, obviously, most of the stories and most of my grey hairs re revolve around Jimmy White, you know. And Jimmy was just amazing because he was on another planet most of the time, you know, and he was so popular in Asia. They used to worship him and then he'd disappear for a couple of days and I'd be like, where's he gone? I need him for a sponsor trip or to meet somebody. But the, my favourite was a guy in Hong Kong who was a big Jimmy White fan, took us out on his huge liner boat and we parked outside this uh, small island, a few hours outside Hong Kong. And they, he had a speedboat on the back towing it and Jimmy said, can I have a go in your speedboat? Well, this guy would have given Jimmy his back teeth. He was in love with him. He said, of course, Jimmy, take my speedboat. And Jimmy took it out and flipped it over and sunk it. <laughs> and Jimmy turned around and said, sorry about that, mate. You know, tell us what I owe you. And I'm like, Jimmy, that, even in those days, that speedboat's like 50, 60, 100,000 pounds. Oh, blimey. And we all dived in and we we're trying to write, you know, put the boat up and scoop everything. It was, it was chaos, but it was so much fun. You know, you couldn't... You couldn't look back and say, well, that was a quiet day or everything was a learning. You know, we were learning about life. We were learning about the sport. We were learning about different cultures. And it was a fascinating time in my life. Probably the most exciting time was the early days of snooker. If we were to fast forward, I know before, kind of prior to taking ownership of, of, of World Snooker, you, you were quite reluctant to, to get involved. What, what was it that sort of changed your mind? And, and... I, it was clear I wasn't welcome in the snooker pa circles of power. Um, so you, you leave and you concentrate on people that wanted your services and your help. They didn't uh, until the time when the sport was in such a low point that the players, some of the players came to me and said, would you get involved again? And then I had to think, do I want that aggravation? Do I want to go backwards? And actually the answer was yes. I think I owe this sport something because it started me off. I enjoy the sport. And I was frustrated at the lack of progress the sport was making. And given where we are now with 25 events, £14 million pounds of prize mm. money this season, just how pleased are you? That you've yeah, done it's, it's always nice to, be know, to know you're right. You know, it's always nice to be successful and numbers don't lie. But the joy for me is that we haven't even started. You know, I think we've made a lot of progress. Um, some people don't understand long-term strategy planning, which is something that I think I've always specialised in. Logistics are a key part of what I do, formats, structure. Uh, initially, they probably think you're mad. And then over the years, they suddenly realise that Baza knows what he's talking about. And I do, you know, and uh, there's no point, you know, when you get to my age, you don't, you don't suffer modesty. You just tell the truth, you know, I'm the best in the world at what I do and anyone who disagrees with me is wrong. So when you start off with that principle, the only way is up. And then um, if, if we were to look forward and see where, where you could take snooker, if, if you're sort of snooker utopia, what would the world of snooker look like? I think, it's about, I think it's mainly about respect for sport and sportsmen. And what we see in, in snooker is we're, we're on the journey of getting that perception of respect class. I suppose the golf model is the one I look at most and think, you know, my viewing figures on snooker dominate globally golf. And yet the prize money in golf is a lot bigger and the perception of the sport is a lot better. So that's what we're working towards. And, you know, we, we had our first million pound prize money coming out of China this year, which is long overdue. I think that will escalate. But also because we've structurally govern the game so well, 
in the terms of filled the calendar, kept everybody busy. Now people that want to come into their new world of snooker have got to pay an asking price far beyond what we've used to. And finally, I just wanted to finish on talking about the fact that actually in May you were put into the Snooker Hall of Fame. Yeah. And um, I know we, we don't often see you show your emotions, but you did uh, on yeah, the stage was, there. Was, How much did it mean to you? It was peculiar because I never, I mean, obviously, we have board meetings where these things are discussed. So I'm going to sack all my directors because they must have had a board meeting without me. And I remember, you know, the Dorchester, they say we've got two inductions. And I'm thinking to myself, I remember Ding Jong Wee. Who's the other one? And, I, and, I, and it never actually, I, so it's stupid, because obviously I've, in the cold light of day, I think I'm going to get it sooner or later, you know. But it never occurred to me until Steve Davis got up and started talking. And then it was a little bit emotional, just for a few seconds, because this has been a big part of my life, you know, and I'm proud of what we've achieved. And I think we can do better. And I'm not going to stop. There's something very special about getting something from your peers, people that are involved in the game. You know, we all can be the tough guy. I don't care about other people. My opinion counts, etc., etc. The reality is, it's nice to have people say, well done. It doesn't happen very often. And when it happens in an occasion like that, it is emotional. Well, Barry, thanks for talking to us. I'm sure there's a lot more exciting moments in your snooker career ahead. Thank you very much. Thanks. In last month's episode, we introduced you to a brand new challenge, the Great British Break-Off. And Ali Carter made a flying start, passing eight out of the possible ten reds. That's right, and next up to the plate is newly crowned Riga Masters champion, Neil Robertson. So can the Thunder shoot down the captain? Did you get because of the pun and the flying pun thing? Uh, I thought it was all right. Anyway, let's get straight into it. This is the Great British Break-Off. We haven't got the drone. What are you doing? What happened to the drone? We have this bit for that, no? No, no, we used the budget all on Days Watch 5. And that is nearly all we've got time for this episode. Coming up next month. Mark Williams looks to defend his Sanctum Six Red World Championship title in Bangkok. Then it's time for a new look Shanghai Masters. Ronnie O'Sullivan will hope to defend his crown and become the winner of Snooker's richest ever invitational event. We then head south to skyscraping Guangzhou for Evergrande China Championship where last year Luke Purcell became the first player from continental Europe to win a ranking title. And finally we return to Lommel, 
the d88.com European Masters. So which events are you doing, mate? Uh, I am doing Guangzhou again, actually. We're looking forward to that. Oh, really nice. good. Yeah. Nice. So I've got Shanghai. No, Roddy's doing Shanghai. Roddy's doing it. So which ones have I got? And that is all we've got time for this episode. We hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you again next month. Lewis, I'm not doing any events at all. Lewis. <laughs>